So technically today our lesson is really verse 3 through 6 because um, the, the tr there's a transition after verse 2 to 3 through, actually 3 through 11. Um, but we didn't finish up with, with verse 2 last week, and I really want to because it can be a controversial verse, and so I want to make sure that you're well equipped to understand what it means. So let's just read, let's just read one, 1 through 6. It says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The one that we transition in three. We, by, by this, we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. And one says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments, then He is a liar and the truth is not in Him. Which is very similar to, verse, to chapter 1. And then verse 5 says, But whoever keeps his word, the love of God, has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked, as Jesus walked. So, back up to verse 2. It says, He himself, which is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. Or propitiation is the appeasement for our sins. And what we're trying to look at here is what John is trying to get us to understand. Because remember, we're deal John is dealing with Gnosticism. I think that's right. Uh, and Gnos is knowledge. And this is really important because the Gnostics thought they had a higher knowledge that you could achieve. And so they were separating themselves out from normal Christians. They said, well, if you get super spiritual someday, you'll make... Because remember, Greeks were all about knowledge, philosophy, Plato. It was all about this higher knowledge. Think of Paul on Mars Hill. Right? Everybody stands up and talks about what they think is the smartest thing on earth. And we talked about last week and the week before. You know, go to a bookstore, go to a library, to the section on self-help, and you'll see... Thousands and thousands of books on, on self-help, on knowledge. Achieving a higher knowledge will make you understand life a little bit better. So what man never does, man never takes the initiative to placate God in view of his sins. Instead, God took it upon himself. He took the initiative to satisfy his own wrath, right, by giving his, showing his love to every guilty sinner by sending his son to the cross to die for us. So... Rather than man piling up good works and sacrifices to placate God's wrath, the Bible says that God did what our works and efforts could never do. He sent His Son as the righteous substitute to bear our sin for wrath, for, for the wrath that was due. I think we all know that, but it's easy to fall. We talked about it a little bit last week. It's easy to fall into a works mentality because we're raised and we live in a works-based culture. Right? If you get if you when you're a child, if you do all your chores, you get whatever the reward you're rewarding your children with. So you see the reward base in school. If you behave, you don't have to stay after school. Or if you behave, you might get to leave school early. So everything at work, if you do your job the way you're supposed to and excel at it, working, 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 then you may get the promotion. So then what happens is, and this is where the problem of, of, of the, and I'll, I'll say the problem of the Greeks, but it's a problem of everyone. We see it, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians is all about the damage being done in the church because what happens is you got these, these uh, Corinthians who are non-Jews, most of them, and you say, so they're bringing all of this, this knowledge of the world just like the Gnostics are doing, and then they have this Christianity thing. And they see the Christianity, they understand it, but then they try to put both together, so you end up with this Gnostic thing because they're trying to say, oh yeah, I know Jesus died for my sins, but all spirit is good, all flesh is bad, so it doesn't matter what I do with these old bones. I can sin all I want because I've rationalized the fact that I've been saved and my spirit is good. So we bring all that in. So we do the same thing. God will love me more if I spend at least 30 minutes in the morning in prayer and studying God's Word. And if I don't, he's going to love me less and not do good things for me today. That's works-based religion. That was the problem the Pharisees had. 
That's the problem we see in the Roman Catholic Church. It's the same thing. It's a works-based mentality. And what we're saying is, I can work my way into God loving me more. And what the Bible says is, no way. God already loves you all He can in spite of the fact that you are a filthy sinner. And nothing you do is good. I mean, that's what I mean. That sounds bad, right? But if Isaiah says that even the best we can do is but filthy rags, I mean, that really means but filthy rags. We can't do it. So, Alistair Begg describes propitiation. I love this definition. An appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God. Let me read it one more time. And a propitiation is an appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God. You know what's missing from that definition? Anything about you or me. Doesn't say we got there. What he says is the propitiation is the appeasement of God's wrath through his love, through his gift of his son. <clears throat> Nothing we can do. That's the point that legalists object to. So legalists worry about, legalists would got to do it right. Everything's got to be right. What they worry about is that you'll fall in, because remember you have, uh, you have legalism, okay, which is works. And then you have licentiousness, which is, uh, call it uber grace. Gnostics were under licentiousness because they said, we got all this grace, I've got all the grace, so therefore I can sin all I want. It doesn't matter what these, but this body does because my spirit is good. My body can't ever, be, can't ever be good, so therefore I rationalize and it's okay to sin. So legalism and licentiousness are not the opposite sides of the thing. They're the same side of the coin. They're both wrong. And legalism often pushes people into licentiousness or licentiousness pushes people into legalism. Because like, well, it can't be free grace. God's gonna, so I gotta get where God will reward me more for behavior, for doing the right things. And he doesn't. Right? What he wants is to build a relationship with us as we go forward. So, um, so people add human works or penance. You heard the word penance, to hedge God's grace, to protect themselves from licentiousness. And so penance. And so what's the problem with penance? Martin Luther exposed penance when he did his 95 thesis that he stuck on the wall at Wittenberg. What he said was, he said, Martin Luther wrote, what a vast difference there is between saying that Christ is the propitiation for our sins and that God must be propitiated by works. And that's the basis of what his 95 thesis was. He says, he's reading the scripture and he says, wait a minute. If God, if I read John, he could read 1 John, right? If I ever read 1 John, it said, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, right? So he says, well, if he's our propitiation, then why do I, why then would God require more propitiation by my works? Does that make sense? In other words, he's, he's already swept the, the slate clean. Why would I go back and do it anymore? He also looked at it this way. He said, he said, the Bible, rather than calling us to legalism or works when we sin, as often as we lapse, we, as often we lapse into sin, we are recalled solely to the satisfaction of Christ. Solely to the satisfaction of Christ. Otherwise, it denies anyone the peace of conscience knowing that he has adequately satisfied God. And what we talked about last week was, if penance is true, if, my wor if I have to work my way into God's grace, then how do you know how much penance to do? That was Luther's, that's what exploded his head to make him stand up against the church of his day. So we talked about last week. Okay, so how much penance or how many works do I need to do if I told a white lie? Versus, well, clearly because we rank, rank sins differently. A white lie is, you know, that's, that's not really that big a sin. But if I cheat on my spouse, that's a huge sin. Well, how much works do I need to do for that? Or what about if I don't honor my father today? How much works? In other words, so how many works? So do you see how many Hail Marys? How many times do I have to go to my knees? How many times do I have to do these things? That's what it is. And what happens is when we do it, oh man, gosh, he, God is not, he just, he's just not going to love me because of what I've done. No, he loves you in spite of what you've done. That's the difference. So we rest in God's grace. So what John is teaching us is that we have to understand God's grace as seen in Christ's sacrifice for, for our sins 
in order to grow in holiness. All John is telling us is, instead of coming out and banging the Gnostics saying, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, what he's saying is, he's writing, and think about how he writes, in verse 1 of chapter 2, my little children, my little children. Go back to chapter 1, verse 1. He's saying, look, man, I don't need to tell you anything new. You know the truth. Go back to what you really know. So when we fall into a works mentality, which we do, I do, I fall into a works mentality, i got to go, wait a minute. God's not going to love me any more or any less. He can't. He is love. He can't. Now, does that mean that he's not going, look, man, you want to act this way? You want to wallow in your sin and ignore your sin that I can tell you? Then you get the great, I love James McDonald, his great wife, choose to sin, choose to suffer. If you want to bring suffering on yourself, sin. Openly sin in God's face. And he'll do what? He'll take his hands off, say, go ahead, you drive, you drive the truck for a while, see how it goes. That's what the whole thing is. Take your hands off the wheel. So, when you add human works to this thing, um, that becomes the problem. But now look at the, what the rest of the verse 2 says. It says, and not only he's a propitiation not only for our sin, but for the whole world. Now, people align that to say that means God loves everybody and is going to save everybody. But, what do we do? We know that we have to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So, what does that verse really mean? Um, a couple of things. One is, I, I believe why John is writing that is to counter the heretics who claim to have knowledge of salvation was exclusive and secret. Remember, they've got a secret knowledge. But John's saying, wait a minute. Christ's sacrifice extends to the whole world. So in other words, His grace is not just for an enlightened few, right? It's, just, it's not just for the Jews, it's for the whole world. Anyone who trusts in Christ's sacrifice for his sin can be saved. That's what he's pointing out here. So what does whole world mean? I think whole world means two things. It is, so when we look at the idea of whole world from from John's perspective. So you have an unlimited view and you have a limited view of the whole world. So, and as it applies to what? Because we'll go back to the verse. He's the propitiation for our sin. He's the appeasement for our sins. By the way, just not only ours, but for the whole world. So what does it mean? It's unlimited. In other words, Christ made the atonement for the whole world in a provisional sense. In a provisional sense. So Christ is a propitiation for our sins, that would be as Christians, and for the whole world. But it's limited because Christ died for only those in the world who would believe. That's why it's limited. The hour refers to converted Jews and converted Gentiles who believe. So you say, well, how do I know you're right, Raymond? Well, I'll tell you how you know I'm right. Because if you go to John 3.16, what's he say there? Same writer. And what's he say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right, that whosoever believes. Okay, so He said God so loved the whole world that He sent His Son to die on the cross. Now, wait a minute. But who did He die on the cross for? Whosoever believes in Him. So there is a transaction that has to happen. In other words, His death isn't effective for the whole world. It's available for the whole world. It's available for whosoever shall believe. So again, we have to take Scripture to interpret Scripture. Same writer, he's writing the same, he's basically writing the same thing in verse 2 that he wrote in John 3.16. Or the Holy Spirit had him write in 3.16. It has to be accepted. In other words, it's available, but it's got to be accepted in order to get the benefit out of it. So, understanding God's grace will lead us to holiness. Because remember, in, here in verses 1 and 2 is about holiness. Our holiness. And so he's, he's using God as an example and saying, this is what you're supposed to shoot for. So, the question is, whole, is holy living a possibility? And I think it is. John writes, so that you may not sin in verse 1, right? He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But, like he says, but if you do, you have an advocate. That's the key. If you do, you have an advocate. So, even though we can never attain sinless perfection, God is perfectly holy, right? Can we be perfectly holy? No. We cannot. So, then what's John trying to tell us? I think what he's trying to tell us is we have to live in consistent victory over sin. Consistent 
victory over sin. In other words, is sin controlling you or are you controlling your sin? Which one is it? So John says in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he says, same thing. Little children, make, no, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, just as Christ is righteous. And the one who practices sin is of the devil. Practices righteousness. So that's what we want to look. So holiness for us is to practice righteousness. Is to practice righteousness. So what does practice mean? It's practice. You hear people say, um, I have a, a lawyer says I have a law practice. In other words, I, this is what I do. So what we do is we practice righteousness. Doesn't mean fake righteousness. It means we practice righteousness. We're striving for righteousness. We're striving to live in consistent victory over sin. Christians can and must live holy lives. And we can. We practice right. We strive for righteousness in all we do. Since perfect holy living is not a possibility, since we can't, and he says, and if you do sin, by the way, in a great, you've got an advocate. You've got an advocate who stands before us. And I think what he's talking about here when he says we, we have an advocate, he includes himself. And I think it's really important, again, go back to Gnostics. Gnostics have this, uh, uh, we call it a secret knowledge. They claim the secret knowledge. But now look what John, and remember, we talked about what John is doing here. John is in, historically we believe he's in Ephesus, but he's in Asia Minor. So he's preaching and teaching in all these churches around Asia Minor where Paul had gone on three missionary journeys. And so now they're saying they got this secret knowledge. And what is John doing? We talked about early on. John is using his apostolic authority. Now if you go back to chapter 1, look at those first verses. He says, I saw him, I heard him, I touched him. Well, it was important to understand what Gnosticism is, because part of Gnosticism also said Jesus wasn't really a man. He was like an aberration or he was like a ghost. Well, what Paul said, what John says is, no, I saw him, I heard him, I touched him. He was real. So he's using his apostolic authority. But what he doesn't want to do is set himself above everybody. So look what he says. He says in this, he says, we, right, and by this we know, and he says, I'm writing these things so you may, and if anyone sins, here's the key, verse 1, we have an advocate. So what's John doing? John's saying, even though I'm an apostle, even though I knew Jesus personally, I walked with Jesus, I was standing there when Lazarus came out of the tomb, I was standing there when he, when he fed the 5,000 people, I saw this stuff happen, but yet, you know what he says? When we sin, when I sin. What he's saying. So I believe what he's doing here is he's reminding this, even though I am an apostle and I have great authority, I am no better than you. Do you see that? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. So what he's trying to do, again, he's banging on the Gnostics who say, I'm elevated, I've got a secret knowledge, which in essence says, Jesus, God loves me more than he loves you. And what he's saying here is, no, I'm just like everybody else. Um, to grow in holiness, We'll never get to the point where we never sin. We realize that. But the goal is to live in consistent victory over it. So understanding His grace through this consistent, uh, through a consistent victory, then we know because we're not freaked out every time we sin about, oh my gosh, God's going to hate me for this. No, He's not. He loved you so much that He sent His Son. So when we think about God's amazing grace, again, the difference between legalism and licentiousness is when we think about His grace, then what do we do? We see the love that he sent for us, right? And it will make you, it should. So the question which we're going to come to next is, are you a true child of God? And that's verses 3 through 6. And he's going to give us some tests so that you can know if you're a true child of God. One of the ways you know is if you are, is do you hate sin? When you sin, does it grieve you? Or it's like, eh, no big deal. I got, you know, because I got my holy ticket. I'm, 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 I'm going or those of us have been around here a long time in Orlando, we got an e-ticket, right? I got e-tickets, man, so it doesn't really matter. I got e-tickets. So that's the thing. I've already. So do you hate, so you say, what is victory over sin? Do you hate your sin? Does it grieve your sin because you go, I'm grieving the Holy Spirit when I sin? The one who stood and, 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 and went to the cross for me? I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. You know, thanks for doing that, bud. I mean, that's not very holy in that. 
the Apostle Peter urges us, go to uh, 2 Peter 1. These are great verses. 5 through 8, and then he ties it in in 9. And, and this could be a way to look at yourself and say and talk about victory over sin. So uh, 1 Peter 1. 2 Peter. Second, Second Peter, sorry, yeah, you're right, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. Where is verse 5? Yeah, <laughs> for this very reason, and here's, here, here's the way you do it. Make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, Godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that's the key, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? So, I mean, if you kind of look at that in reverse, here's what, it say, here's what he's saying. You are useless and unfruitful in your walk with Christ, if, go backward, read it backwards, if you are not making every effort to supplement your faith with goodness and with knowledge and with self-control and with endurance and with godliness and with brotherly affection and with love, then you're useless for the kingdom. Right. Now look at verse 9. He ties it all in. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. So if we forget those things, so you say, well, hey man, he called us to holy living, how do we do it? Go to 2 Peter and look at that and start asking yourself those questions. Just ask yourself, am I, I got my faith. So if you look at, if you look at verse 5 there, the first thing it says, add to your faith, which means we know he's talking to believers. I got the faith, all right? So if I want to practice righteousness, go to 2 Peter, I got to start figuring out, am I doing good in any of those seven Seven action verbs there. Am I doing anything with those? Am I, do I have goodness in me? Am I striving to be good? Am I striving for brotherly affection? Am I striving for godliness? I mean, you don't need a, you don't need a theological degree to understand godliness. Am I striving to be more like Jesus? Or am I not? Or am I letting the world take over me? Because what he says is, if you're not striving for those things... You're useless and unfruitful for the kingdom of God. So you say, well, I want to be useful. I want to do things for the kingdom. Then go to 2 Peter and start doing what he says. Remembering what Christ did for us on the cross will motivate us to hate sin and grow in holiness. And that's what John wants. He wants us to grow in holiness. So now, he, now what he's going to do is he's going to take us into verses 3 through 11. He's going to say, you know what? I want you to test yourselves to see if you are a believer. Are you a true child of God? That's going to be 3 through 11. He's going to give three different tests. First test is obedience. Second test is uh, love. Third test is doctrine. So he's going to give us three tests in these verses. We're just going to look at obedience in the first one. There are some things in life you need to be sure about. Right? One of which, probably the most important, is your eternal destiny. You need to know that you know that you know that you're saved. So you, you, you may be really comfortable with that. I am. But you know what? There are a lot of people who are not. And they question, am I saved? Well, this is a great way you can walk them through very simply to say, look, if you're questioning your faith, start taking this test and see how you perform. The Bible warns us again and again about deceived people. Right? Jesus himself said, they're going to come to me one day, we did this and we did that in your name. And he says, dude, I never knew you. Out. Right? So in other words, do we have a saving knowledge of God? So last week we talked about the abundant grace of, of, of God, and we talked about it here at the beginning of this as well. But Jude 4 says this, always in danger. Jude 4 says turn to, that, we, that people mistakenly turn the grace of God into licentiousness, and they deny the Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So then what are they doing? They deny Him by doing what? Turning the grace into licentiousness, uber grace. I do whatever I want, right? Because it doesn't matter because I'm going to heaven. 
Well, what John's saying is you need to check your salvation if that's the way you think. The true grace of God teaches us, and I didn't write this down, did I? No, Titus 2.12 says, To deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what the true grace of God would teach us to do. So, what the Apostle John now is going to do is he's going to put these tests up to say, um, is your faith true or false? Is it genuine or fake? Is, are you really regenerated or are you not regenerated? In other words, he, John says, I can tell you whether you're saved or not. Hmm. Okay, well, let's look at this test of obedience. And we're just going to break this down by verse, real simply. Um, <clears throat> verse 3a says, by this we know that we have come to know him. By this, we've come to know that we know him. In other words, this is the purpose of John writing the, this epistle. Um, in 1 John 5, 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So watch this verse right here. Oh, I did write that. This right here. This is the key verse to this test that, we, that you're asked. Right here. So here's the key verse. Let me read it again. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. In other words, I want you to know that you know. I don't want you to have any doubt. Because if you're doubting, then you're not going to, then, 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 then you're wallowing if we do that. So what are these things? I write these things. This is in chapter 5. These things refer to everything that John has written which concerns these tests of genuine faith. Obedience, which we'll see in 3 through 6. Then we'll see love, and then we'll see sound doctrine. And it's interesting that he says that you may know. Now, I think that's a reference to the Gnostics, because in this little epistle of 1 John, he uses the word know 25 times. 25 times. And what I think he's trying to do is remember, Gnostic, Gnost, equals knowledge. And so he's trying to say, you know, you know. So if I write these things so that you may know, so you're not getting freaked out by the Gnostic heretics who say, well, I don't, you know, I've got this secret knowledge. If you don't have the secret knowledge, maybe you really don't know who God is. The Gnostics boasted all knowledge, right? They claimed that they knew God and believed in Christ, but they had no desire to keep the moral law of God. I started today with Catherine with the verse on rationalization. That's what the Gnostics were doing. They were rationalizing their sin. You know what? I can sin. I can do anything I want because it doesn't matter. I've got my e-ticket. That's the philosophy that they had. Uh, they gave an intellectual assent. And John, what he's really pointing out here is an interesting thing. He says, he, he's pointing out that no religious knowledge is valid without moral consequences. So if there's no moral consequences, is your knowledge real? See, I think if you think, so a Gnostic would think, there is no moral consequence for my sin. Well, then clearly, you can't be saved. You can't, it, it wouldn't work that way. Um, A.W. A. Tozer wrote this. He said, this is the age of profession. For many give intellectual assent to Christ, but show no desire to follow him. Men want an easy religion. Thousands of men and women every year are still undertaking to follow Christ without even pausing to reflect on the cost of their enterprise. The result is the great scandal, the great scandal of Christendom today, so-called nominal Christianity. In countries in which Christian civilization is spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with a decent but thin veneer of Christianity. They have allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. Their religion is, great, is a great soft cushion. It protects them from the hard unpleasantness of their life while changing its place and shape to suit their conscience. No wonder the cynics speak of hypocrites in the church and dismiss religion as an escape from reality. If you're not uncomfortable in your faith, what Tozer, A.W. Tozer is saying is if your faith isn't making you uncomfortable, is it real? So what's uncomfortable? Uh, uncomfortable would be uh, my sin. Is, it, it, I hate my sin. It, it bothers me to the point that 
I'm like, how could I let my Lord and Savior down that way? That's getting uncomfortable. Stepping out of our comfort zone to go to a rehab facility in Lake Mary and say, anybody doing a Bible study here? Can I do a Bible study here? That's getting out of your comfort zone. That's the difference in it. Um, verse 3b says, so verse 3 says, by this we know we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Or, you know, a better word sometimes there is obey. If we obey. Keep's like, yeah, I need to keep up with things. Obey is like, uh, obey, right? There's a difference there. So I think in the translation, keep is in the NAS. But I think obey actually is a better word there because it implies obey, right? In other words, here's the commandments. I need to obey them. So how do we know whether we've been saved? Apply the test of moral obedience. Do you desire to keep the commands of God? If you desire, listen, we don't do it perfectly, none of us. But do you have a desire to please Him who saved you? If you do, then you've passed the test of moral obedience. It's that simple. The present willingness to keep the commandments of God is a sign of a valid saving relationship. Let me read it again. The present willingness to keep the commandments of God, willingness, right, uh, is a sign of valid saving relationship. It is proof that an act of union with Christ has already occurred because there is a desire to keep God's moral law. It's an obligation, right? Faith is a condition of salvation. If James McDonald wrote this. This is a great line. Faith is the condition of salvation, but one proves, evidences, and demonstrates the reality of his faith by obedience to God. So in other words, the evidence, what's the evidence of my faith? My desire to be obedient to what God has called me to do. And not just called me to do like called me to teach, but called me to do and how I am to live my life. Although, you know, go back to the simple things, right? <clears throat> love my wife as Christ loved the church. Honor my father. You know, don't, don't, I mean, go to simple things that are there. Put others above myself. Seek other people's welfare first. All those things come together. John's claim is if we obey him, <clears throat> if we have a desire to obey him, then we can claim that we know him. Interesting because, so we think about the John and his apostolic authority, he was there. So where did John get these ideas from? He got them, in fact Patrick was talking about this Wednesday night, he got them in the upper room the last night before Christ went to the cross. Jesus said all these things, we're looking at them, all these things in John 14 and 15, he said, it was the last things he said to John, other than, that's my, my mother, she's your mother now, take care of her on the cross when he said that. But listen to what he's just recounting what Jesus said. You see, John is simply, he, instead, of, instead of pointing out where the heretics are wrong, he's saying, remember what you know. Don't go back to, sometimes John, the book of 1 John, can be back to basics. Which is also revival. We want to revive our relationship with him by going back to basics. So here's John 14, 15. Jesus' words, last words to John. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love what, you, what I did for you, you'll desire to. John 14, 21, Jesus said again, same conversation. And you know, it's kind of like Paul. When Paul repeats things two or three times in, a, in, in two sentences, you're like, ah, he really wants us to understand that. Well, look what, God, look what the Lord did. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Isn't that what we want? Jesus to reveal himself to us? Right. And, and in fact, Jesus, as he's, and I'm, I don't take this, I don't mean this in a mocking way, as he's sitting there, I believe he's looking. So in John 14, 15 and 14, 21, he says the exact same thing basically twice. And I think he's looking at it because all the apostles have come get their head like a dog, like, hmm. So he repeats it again in 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who has sent me. All in the same sentences. And then a few sentences later in John 15, 10, look what he says. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. That's all in the same sentence while He's sitting there talking to them on the last night that He was with them. Does that mean perfection? It doesn't mean perfection, but a desire or willingness to obey. 
Do you have a desire? So, no one has ever obeyed God perfectly except for Christ. Salvation doesn't make a man perfect, but it does begin to change his desires. So if your desires are changing and you desire things that are obedient to God, again, that's a moral test of your salvation, if you do. Verse 4 says, The one who says, I have come to know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and there is no truth in him. This is the man who professes to know, but a man's words going to be tested by works. That's what James says, right? So if you know who he is, then I ought to be able to see him in your works. Right? We, that guy we talked yesterday, Conrad talked yesterday about the, the service for Florence. And what were the things that he was mentioning about Florence? She was gracious and giving, right? And she led, she taught and gave of herself to lead a woman's Bible study table. Right? She, so those are what? Those are signs that she felt to, that, that she had a desire to be obedient to the things that God told her to do. Graciousness and giving, those are signs. Go back to 2 Peter 1 and look at them. So in other words, how do you know Florence was saved? Look at her fruit. Look at the fruit, absolutely. You see it there. A Christian shows the reality of his faith and love by God by keeping the commandments. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you'll obey what I command. We just read it in 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. It's simple. It really is. Simple test. But we can help people who may really be struggling with, am I saved? Well, let's go back and walk them through these verses. This is not high theology, people. This is low theology. Um, A.W. Tozer went on to say, just as there are phonies in every phase of life, there are phonies in Christianity. They often go to the right places, mingle with the right crowds, and say the right things. They say they believe in Christ, but they disobey the commandments of Christ as a pattern of their life. They have no desire to keep His commandments, and thus they remain unchanged. Charles Spurgeon said, an unchanged life is a sign of an uncleansed heart. I mean, that boils down simple, doesn't it? An unchanged life is a sign of an uncleansed heart. Then on to verse 5. 5a says, but, now here's the good news. Bad news is in 4. In, in four. Then good news is in 5. But whoever obeys or keeps his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. That's kind of weird. Isn't it? God's love made complete. So John now he's talking, about, he's talking about from commandments to word. In particular, the revelation of God's will in his Bible. So in other words, we have to take all of God's word because that's what he's talking about here. He says, anyone who keeps God's word, then God has truly made complete in him. So you're going to say, how can I have a complete, a better, a holy relationship with God? Know his word. Then you go, oh yeah, I can't do that because of this. And it's not a rules based, but I don't want to do that anymore. So we should be going from, oh, I can't do that. I can't think that way to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to think that way. And that's the difference between Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about heart transformation. Behavior modification says, oh, I can't do that. Darn it. Right? That, that's behavior modification. Heart transformation says, I have no desire to do that. Because that would offend my Lord. Go ahead. John MacArthur, I think, broke it down. You could uh, break the fruits of the spirits down into uh, two categories. Um, attitude and action. Attitude and action. Yeah, that's right. You say the fruit of the Spirit broken down into attitude and action. You've got to have both. It can't just be an attitude. It's got to be an action that goes along with it. But the attitude ought to drive you to Something the action. The heart changes. Yeah, your heart. It changes. It changes. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to think that way. Um, when we begin to obey God and realize His love that's taken root in our hearts, Right? then what will we do? It will manifest itself in a practical love towards God, but also towards our fellow man. Whether that love is for the love that we have for our fellow believers, right? a brotherly love like that, but also a love for the brokenness of those that are unsaved. We ought to have a desire for that. So it's, it, it's, it's not either or, it's both and. So the question is, are you willing to obey God? That's what John's challenging us. He says, look, if you're questioning your faith, then here's a simple question to, to, to ask yourself. Are you willing to obey God? Are you willing to say, what, Lord, whatever you make clear to me, I am pre-committed in my heart to do. 
whatever you make clear to me, I'm pre-committed in my heart to do. That's, you know, versus the double-minded man who's always looking for, you know, which, which way is the both. I love this. I brought this to Randy. He's not here today. But let me, just, let me say this again. Whatever he makes clear to you, are you pre-committed in your heart to do? Pre-committed. In other words, we talked last week about God wants to shine his light into our lives. Why? Not to go, you're wrong. But he's saying, look, man, I just want to shine it in so that you can see your sin and how it's impacting your relationship with me. It's not about cut the sin out. It's about, look, the sin is impacting your relationship with me, which then does what? Impacts my ability to be fruitful for the kingdom. That's what first, or Second Peter says, right? He says you're useless and unfruitful if you're not practicing these things. And that's the double-minded man. The double-minded man, out of James 1, 2. The double-minded man is a man whose heart is divided, watch this, divided between allegiance to God and allurements of the world. In other words, he's not sure he wants to know God's wisdom because he isn't fully committed to submitting to it. It would be nice to know God's wisdom for the situation, but before he commits to obeying it, he needs to find out if he likes it. In other words, he's shopping for answers that fit what he wants to do. Rationalizing. Shopping for answers that fit what he wants him to do. Um, if God's wisdom sounds good, he'll follow it. But if worldly wisdom sounds better, he'll follow that. James says in verse 7 that such a person will not receive anything from the Lord. So in, 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 in verse 8 says, if you're double-minded, verse 7 says you're not going to receive anything. And that's Alistair Begg's definition, by the way. John Bunyan said, called the double-minded man, Mr. Facing Both Ways. He has a sense of what is right, but a love for what's wrong. You see where, they, see where that comes in here? John says, are you willing... When God makes His will clear to you, are you pre-committed to obeying it, even if it makes you uncomfortable? Even if it makes you uncomfortable. And listen, uncomfortable can be simple. Uncomfortable can be, you know what, I really don't want to work in the nursery, but Lord, if you want me to work in the nursery, then I'll get with Gina and I'll sign up and say, how can you use me, Gina? Right? Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. It can be that, it can be that simple. It also can be uncomfortable with, you know what, I need to go to my brother and, and confess to him. Some, a, a bad, something I did, or maybe just a bad thought I had about it. Right? I need to confess that to him. That gets uncomfortable because nobody wants to admit they're wrong. I don't. Never. I don't like to. So you may have a lot of problems as a Christian, and you may sense weakness or lack in your life, but one thing is clear. If you are keeping his commandments, if you have a desire to obey him so that you can know him more, then you can be sure you're saved. Christianity is not intellectualism or mystical emotion, but moral obedience. I mean, it's just simple. You want to be holy? Then strive for moral obedience. Strive for it. Seek it. Go after it. Strive, in, strive is not in the lazy boy going, well, you know, if it comes this way, I'll grab it. No, strive is out of the lazy boy going after it. Go and get it. Let me see your word, God. Take me to your word. Let me see this. Go, go to Proverbs on a daily basis. Look at the things. Because Proverbs just opens your eyes up. Come on, that was stupid. I did that again. I, you know, how come I look at, don't look at it that way? Oh, yeah, I'm rationalizing again. Yeah, he says that. There, by the way, the, the, the rationalization in Proverbs is throughout Proverbs. You can see it. We rationalize all of these things. Um, 5B said, this is how we know we are in him. And 6, whoever claims to abide in him ought to walk as Jesus walked. Ought, must, should. You know, it's not, it's an imperative there. The word abide means to continue in and means the same thing as fellowship. So in other words, are you abiding? Are you in constant fellowship with God? That's why when Paul says, pray without ceasing, right? And again, we want to define prayer as, okay, I'm sitting or I'm kneeling or it's quiet in my hands and I'm, I'm, I'm like this. No, pray without ceasing just means being in fellowship with God all day long. Boom, boom, boom. In fellowship with God. I'm looking for Him. I'm looking for His ways. I'm doing all this, right? And so it's all of those It's all of those things. Megan wanted to do some treatment this week that's really tough and she was waiting and waiting and waiting and her pancreas levels, when she got in, she couldn't do it. And so she texted me, can't do it today. Can't do it. Pancreas problems. Right? And so the response was, my response to her, which we've been praying a lot about this, talk about this, God clearly didn't want you to do it today. 
If he wanted you to do it today, then you would have done it today. God's way, he didn't want you to do it. So that's how we look at it, as opposed to fussing about it. It's the same thing. The person who says he is in God or in relationship with God and abides in God or has communion or fellowship with Him has a moral responsibility and obligation to walk as Christ walked. Keep it simple. Yeah, but you have a moral obligation and responsibility to walk as He walked. Now, I mean, we can't in perfection, but we have an obligation. In other words, when we signed up for this thing, we, got, we were born again, he left us here for a mission, for a reason. And he says to us, you have a, I don't know if he says this. The implication is, you have an obligation. If somebody saved your life, wouldn't you feel like you have an obligation to do something for them? But he did, so do you, is the question. To walk as he walked uh, has to be put in the context of obedience. Um, means we, 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 don't, we act out of the principle of what He has told us to do. So Christ lived in constant fellowship with the Father, and that resulted in what? A continual obedience to the Father's will. And this is where we have to back up from the Gnostics because we have to remember that Jesus was just like us. He was tempted in every way we're tempted. He was fully man. Fully man. And yet he walked perfectly. So, how, so all we need to do then is say, well, how did he do it? Okay, well, let's look at a couple of verses. John 4, 34. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So, okay, you want to walk like to see him. Man, I, 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 don't understand. I don't understand what he means here when he says in verse 6, the one who abides in him ought walk himself in the same manner Jesus walked. Well, I, I can't walk like Jesus walked. Well, you can, because he says, my food is to do the will of sent me and finish his work. So the question, then we take that, you take what Jesus did, how he operated, right? If you want to be, I don't care what it is, an athlete, uh, an electrician, you want to be an electrician, how do you start being an electrician? You go, you start becoming an apprentice for somebody. And you do what? You watch how they do it. You learn how they do it. You walk how they walk, right? And as an apprentice, you come along till you become till you can become a full electrician. That's how it is. But you got to do what? You got to emulate what that person does. So what we need to do is says, I want to be a Christian. I want to fulfill the role that God has for me. Then what do you do? I need to do what? Well, let me see. Uh, so if I want a Christian role model, who would? Oh, Jesus would be the perfect role model. So now I go and look and say, well, what did Jesus do? Jesus says, my food. Interesting. My food. What I live for is to do the will of him who sent me. That's it. So if, 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 if he says my food because he's saying my entire life. Because we all have to have food to live, right? You've got to have food. So he says to have live, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That means you've got to be seeking his will. Part of seeking His will. Go back to chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2 is allowing God to shine that light into our hearts so that He can work on rough and taking those rough edges off. John 5.30, He says it again. He says, by myself, this is Jesus. He's talking in the flesh because He's fully man. Watch what He says. By myself, I can do nothing. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Moral obedience is doing the will of the Father who sent you, and not seeking to please yourself, but to please he who sent you. So, he saved you, and he sent you into the world for a reason. The question is, what is it? As a Christian walks in fellowship with the Father through Christ, he will be obedient to the Father's will. We'll close with this. Martin Lloyd Jones said this If you have the life, it is bound to show itself. If it does not, then you have not found the life. You cannot be receiving the life of Christ without becoming like Him. You cannot walk with God without keeping His commandments. You cannot know God without immediately, automatically loving Him. Love always manifests itself by doing what the object of its love desires. Let me read that one more time. Love always manifests itself by doing what the object of its love desires. 
So is the object of our love the Lord Jesus Christ? If it is, then we just need to follow the examples that he has set for us. And we can walk as he wants. Amen? Yes. Yes.